Hey guys, this is Bluff Monkey back again for Sonic Academy and today we're going to take a further look at the chord memory device and arpeggiator section of Anna 2. I know it still causes a little bit of confusion, um, so we'll take a look at specifically how these two devices um, work with each other. So let's get straight into it. Right, so I'm not going to do a massively in-depth tutorial on each and every feature of um, either device, <clears throat> but we'll go through it quickly. So the CMD, chord memory device, allows you to save chords into Anna 2 itself. Um, now we can either do that as a single or as a multiple. So let's quickly have a look at that. So if we choose single, this bottom row of keys here is the location where the Mem the, the chord is stored and the top is the actual chord itself or chords. Now in single, we don't have a, a chord memory location. Uh, each chord is mapped out or transposed across the keyboard. So for example, if I just place in a C major chord here, each note that I press uh, is represented by a major, a major, um, triad uh, with the root note on that particular key. So C major if I press C, D major if I press D, E major, and so on and so forth. Now if I press multi, what that allows me to do is select a note at the bottom and then I can place a chord on that one particular note. Then I can select another note at the bottom and then I can place a chord on that particular note. So if I press C, I get a major chord, a C major. If I press D, I get a C minor because that's the, the notes I placed into the top section here. Now these aren't transposed. They will always be a C major and C minor because those are the notes that I placed in the top here. But I can transpose them with these arrows at the bottom, at the top here. All right, but you can't actually, or it won't transpose across the keyboard because you, you are saving a particular chord to a particular note on the keyboard. Now, if you notice, I can hold the chord down and I can play other notes as well. So the chords are only stored on the notes uh, indicated here with a dot on them. So the chord memory device itself is fairly straightforward. Um, one other thing we'll have a look at is the strum feature. Now the strum feature, if I switch this on, doesn't actually do anything uh, until you use the mod wheel. So the mod wheel is, is like running your hand across a guitar, if you think about it that way. So you have a look at the mod wheel down here. As I'm using the mod wheel, it's effectively kind of mimicking you pushing a, a plectrum or your finger across the guitar, uh, across the guitar strings. Um, you can also learn a chord. So if I press <clears throat> E at the bottom here for the location and I hit learn, I can do something like a different chord there. So instead of placing it in note by note, I can actually just play it on my keyboard. Turn learn off. And it'll save it to that location. Uh, we can do things like reset, next, previous. I'm not going to go into those more obvious uh, features. And then there's a selection of presets where lots of different chords can be stored. So that's fairly self-explanatory. But now we need to move on to the ARP. Okay, so I think this, um, this is where a lot of confusion arises. So if we switch the ARP on, or open the window at least, let me just clear it. So in this instance, I've actually already, let me just switch onto the right channel. I've already stored a selection of chords. So if we turn, and by the way, this little section here allows you to turn both the CMD and ARP on at the same time. So if we have a look at this section here, Those are the chords that I've stored just for demonstration purposes. And if you look at this 
little box here, it will actually tell you which chords uh, are being played. So if you put the chords in and you don't really know what they are, that'll tell you what they are. But I think this, um, the ARP section is where a lot of confusion arises. So it looks like a step sequence. So it looks like it should work like a piano roll, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually work that way. <clears throat> now, you have six possible notes to choose from. And if we look at the note order box over on the right here, let's just go through the UI a little bit. So we've got the amount of steps that we're using. Okay. If you look at the bar on the top there, that tells you how many steps are being used in total. The step rate, at the moment we're set to 1 16th notes. Hold simply means that when you press one note down, the arpeggiator, arpeggiator is just going to keep running without you needing to keep the note pressed down. Retrigger means that it starts from the first step each time you hold a note down. Sync is obvious, syncs with a door. Clear, if I put loads of note data in here, that button will clear it. Then we've also got modulation two modulation slots so you can actually put varying amounts of modulation in so this is very similar to having a modulation amount in the mod matrix but this allows modulation per step uh, we might have a look at that in a second uh, you've got two of those and then there's a velocity velocity lane as well and you get some mod matrix like boxes here where these mod step step mods can be sent to uh, various different targets. But that's not, I think, where the confusion lies. So if I put some note data in here, okay, for example, at the moment, I've got a 16 step sequence, but everything is running off note number one. And what does note number one mean? I think this is, this is the main image. What is note number one? Well, if you think about how an arpeggiator works, usually you have to provide an arpeggiator with note data. So you might play a chord, three notes or four notes or five notes. However many notes you use, note one in this, sec in this instance will always be the bottom note. So if you look at this uh, CMD section here, the bottom note I've got is C. The arpeggiator is still off. If I turn CMD off as well, what we're hearing is that note. That's the bottom note of this chord. So if I turn the arpeggiator on, because we're only playing note one, we're only playing this first note of the chord. So if I clear this and then do something like this, now we're going to alternate between the first and the second note of the chord or the first and the second note of the note data going into the arpeggiator. So in this case, it's going to be C and then E flat. Okay. Even though note three is visible there, because there's three chords, there's three notes going into the arpeggiator, it's not playing the third one because we're not telling it to. So if I clear that again, we can do another experiment. You can see we're now telling it to play one, three, uh, one, two, three, the, the first three notes in the chord that's being fed into the arpeggiator. <clears throat> now, what happens if we do something like this? So if I tell the arpeggiator to play four notes, It's actually going to leave a blank where we've told it to play the fourth notes because there's no data going into it. We're only actually sending three notes into it, so it can't play the fourth one. But let's say I complete this chord by adding the C an octave above. Now the chord's made up of four notes, the arpeggiator can play four notes because there's four, four notes of data going in there. And I think this is, this is the main issue with understanding this arpeggiator. It's a very powerful tool once you know how to work it. Now, of course, if I clear it, we can do things like uh, do it polyphonically as well. So we can do this. So it acts as a polyphonic arpeggiator as well. So it is, it is combining a step sequencer and an arpeggiator. 
Um, so once you get your head around that, it's a lot easier to understand. That's really all there is to it. That's all you really need to try and understand. They do work in exactly the same way. They just uh, prioritize the notes in a different way. So if we look at note order at the moment, it's going low to high, which is what we've been looking at. If we go high to low, let's just have a look at this display here. Look at, look at what it's doing. It's looking for the highest note first. Now we haven't got any note data in, so let's put some in and see what happens. If I just do something like this, it's not gonna play anything because it's looking for these higher notes. Now let's do something like this. What about if we do something like this? That's playing the high C, by the way. All right, so it's going from the top note down this time. Now, because we don't have any low notes in there, obviously these aren't gonna do anything. But then if I add something like that, if I add two more notes into this chord, we have data to work with. Now, something else to look at is note wrap. Now, what happens here is if you're not feeding the sequencer, the arpeggiator, enough data, it will then reuse the notes that you've already used. So in this case, let's turn this high C off. Now, if we go back to low high, which is what we were using before, <clears throat> so we run out of um, note information to use. Once we get past three notes, there's only three notes in there, it won't play these top three. But if we go to note wrap, it will actually reuse those three notes that we've already used to fill in these last three steps. Okay. And then the last note order mode to use is octave wrap. It does the same thing, except that these last three notes should be an octave higher. So it's reusing the notes, but just pushing them an octave higher. Okay. That's pretty much it. So I hope that's cleared things up for you a little bit. What I would suggest you do is just, you can either use the CMD to provide the note data. And by the way, I can use any of these stored um, memory locations here. So if we do something like, let's go back to low high <clears throat> and just put a series of triplets in. And then listen to what we've got. So it doesn't matter which memory location you use, as long as there's note data going in to the arpeggiator, it will play something. So remember, these aren't, this is not working the same as a piano roll. I keep having to reiterate this because it did actually take me a little while to understand what they'd done with it. This isn't working the same way as a piano roll. This is basically, these notes here are representing the note data going into the arpeggiator. And in some respects, you have to think about it, if you use Ableton Live, you have to think about it like the fold function in the piano roll. When you hit fold, it removes all other notes that you're not using and only leaves the notes that you are using. And that's kind of what this is doing. So you've got a six note limit. So as long as you're only feeding six notes into the arpeggiator, each of these steps will represent one of those notes. That's the way to think about it. So again, I hope that cleared things up and I'll see you guys again soon. Cheers. Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate all the support from you guys. If you love this video, then smash a like. And if you want to be notified about new videos, hit the subscribe and notification buttons. Peace.